Snow Tracks is sponsored by Polaris, Think Outside, Ski Do Snowmobiles, Yamaha, Revs Your Heart, and by iPhone Lubricants, exclusively distributed by Parts Canada. In the storied history of snowmobiling, there are few snowmobiles that have shifted the snowmobile paradigm to the degree that the original Skidoo Rev did. Today, we're going to talk all about the 20th anniversary of the Skidoo Rev. I remember, I didn't remember the hotel, but I saw the name, the Daniel Lodge in Utah. Daniel Summit. That's where, Daniel Summit. Yeah. That's where we introduced the Rev to you for the first yeah. time, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I will always remember when we removed the cover, you were walking around, you were intrigued by all this, and you said, why have you done that beaver tail? <laughs> and I said, we're done, we're done, it won't work. <laughs> Today in the industry, people call it the beaver tail. Yeah. Beaver tail. Yeah. Our feeling at the time was, a, a, a good snowmobiler who ride traditional snowmobile will take a day to get used to the rev. That was our thinking here. Because if you only rode it for 15 minutes, it was so awkward for anybody with experience that, you know, you would reject it. Right away, you would reject it. You needed to spend an hour or more, and then it became obvious. And when you went back to the traditional snowmobile, right. the first turn, oh, oh. Yeah. yeah, it felt weird. Yeah. yeah, it felt weird because you you really felt the the advantage of the rev. We took a lot of risk when I sit down on this. We took a lot of risk. <laughs> and you're you're the one who's saying that. You, I, I think the proper way to say that is you took a lot of risk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it was so radically different. I think the vehicle captured people's imagination. I, well, like you said, once you got on it for more than 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, you're like, I don't want to ride anything else. One of the things that came to the top of my mind right away when I first rode the Rev was the motorcycle ergonomics, the stand-up riding posture. Where, where did that come from? Who, who pushed that ball ahead? He's the expert. Back, I did a little bit of research and went back through uh, some, uh, some of our reports. When we created the advanced concept team in, in, uh, on the snowmobile front in Belcourt, uh, I built a team uh, with uh, Jean-Guy Talbot and a few engineers and a few technicians. And our role was to create new product architectures. And one of the things that we did is we were hiring a ergo expert. Uh, his name is Peter Watson, who, who has uh, his name on, on the patent of the Rev. But basically what he did, he looked at all of our machines that we were doing prior, in fact, looking also at competitors' machine. And back in 96, wrote a report that if we could change the legs and allow the lower and upper muscles uh, of the leg take all the charge we would save so much hurt on the back that was not the solution but that was a problem that was highlighted from that point where were you on that topic at the time i was more in manufacturing i became president of sidu skidu in 1998 and at the time we had 25 27 percent market share and we needed to move the needle and we were introducing a new model, gaining two points. The year after, a competitor would introduce, losing the two points. We had to change the dynamic of the industry. Everyone basically had the same technology, different color. 
we gave the go-ahead to the program in 1998-99 at the end. We introduced the product. It was longer than typical to develop that. Typically, we can design a product between 30 to 36 months. That time it took a bit longer because we had some cost difficulty. And I remember to remove cost from the machine, the original red had no painted panel because we're saving a hundred something dollars and this is what we needed, the additional money we needed to make our margin. And that's how we, we came out with the product and we introduced it uh, in model year 2003. Snow Tracks is sponsored by Hercules Tire. Ride at our strength. There was a lot of things that had to be shuffled under the hood to end up with this too, right? Yes, for sure. But you guys kind of, you guys did an end run and used mostly stuff that was in the ZX. All the, the power pack system, obviously we needed to redo the exhaust system to be better, tighter package, and the suspension. The suspension was... Uh, and, and the steering column. Yeah. Obviously going over. Instead of that the, was a big one. That, that was, what, which enabled the, the, the driver to be pushed forward by 12 inches. And I remember, I remember the guys discussing, you know, the best position to be sitting in a bus is not at the rear end of, of the bus, but it's in between the two axles. So obviously, <laughs> point. So, yeah. so changing the driver and bringing it much forward, hence also allowing for the passenger to be in a more comfortable spot. You gain in comfort by being in the center. Were you guys, I mean, even just a little bit shocked when you put the revs in the hands of racers? and they just killed everybody. Were, were you, was it, were you a little bit shocked or, or did you expect it to go that way? Yes and no, because we knew that uh, everyone who was riding the red in trail condition was a better rider. And we, and had, we heard had heard, heard that Bear Morgan was handling, was handling his, contract. his contract. He came to Valcourt, I remember I had a discussion with him and, and I didn't show him the rev, but we were talking about the new platform and we felt that it was better for a racer. And finally, we signed Blair for two years. I don't remember exactly the numbers, but I think the first year he won, even in a new machine that had some technical challenges, he won about half of the race. But the second year, he was dominant. He, he won 15 out of 17 races in the open mud. It was amazing. Then it was amazing. The, it, was, uh, it was the credibility of the ramp was done. Why did you pull that up when you got the keys to the store, when you were the boss and you were in charge and you're looking for this way to get out of this incremental market share increase and into an exponential market increase? Why did you pick that project? I became president of Sidu Skidu in the fall of 1998 and we needed to do something different uh, to move the needle. We needed to change the dynamic of the industry. And I felt, and we felt, all the, the team who was involved, we felt that we had in our hand something that could change the dynamic of the industry. Then after that, it was, let's go. Did you ever doubt him? Yeah, we know each other quite well. <laughs> it was a leapfrog, and, and Jose was the biggest believer of this. Without him, this would not exist. No, no, but uh, he, honestly, uh, Jose, uh, Jose is the guy that, um, even though there is several people, you know, saying you can't risk this, you can't go that far. It's too too risky. He had the guts to do it. But uh, I will add something. You know, the rev. We can talk about the success of the rev in the snowmobile industry. But the rev gave us the confidence, as a culture, that we could do more pushing technology, pushing innovation. And after the rev, we, we gained confidence and we became more aggressive of doing things differently. Well, it definitely is echoing through your, through your staff that they believe that they can do just about anything if you're leading them. And your role in leadership, I know, I know you don't like talking about this because you're a very, you're a humble guy, which that's, that's really nice. But the truth of the matter is, it's been your leadership that has made the difference to have to have everybody line up behind you 
and take it from, from what you're talking about and turn it into reality. I think it's, it's remarkable. Snow Tracks is sponsored by Princess Auto. Make it work. If, if I were you, I would have been scared when I pulled the trigger, when it was the last step. It was the last prototype version. You had all your data, you were invested in it, you knew where you were gonna go. What was it like when you pulled the trigger and the bullet was in the chamber and there was no going back? There was a risk, but we were confident. You know, I'm lucky because I have very competent people. They need steam design engineering, people in marketing and in manufacturing. Then it was a risk, but we knew we had the better product. After that, it was a question of execution. And I knew that we had the talent to execute and make it a commercial success. It's easier today because it was a success and I'm still here. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the, point, the point I want to make is, uh, is when, you have, when you're surrounded by a group of people and you have a, a recipe that works, you have a governance that works, um, it's easier to make those calls. BRP products are all outstanding exercises in styling. Uh, how much equity did you feel in the project from a styling standpoint? Packaging up all of those pieces that have been moved in places they never were before. But that's, the, that's one thing I'd like to correct is that what we do, I have an advanced concept team with engineers and technicians in my team. And we come up with new product architectures. That's our role. That is our role to create, not to industrialize, but to come up with something that considers consumer needs, ergonomics and everything else, and package the, the mechanical package all around and everything to provide a new architecture that provides a new experience to the consumer. All these new architectures are born from our advanced concept team, which we have designers, engineers working hand in hand. So overall, uh, I'm happy with the evolution of the REV up to today's generation. We talked a bit about the racing aspect and the, uh, the instantaneous success on the racetrack. Where's the common thread that brings that kind of use of a snowmobile racing back to the consumer and the consumer's influence? What, what, what is that dynamic? When we introduced the REV to the world in, in February 2002, who we were winning in racing, then the REV had that credibility that it was a fast machine. And after that, it was to convince the dealer. We built about 50 prototypes that we did bring in Quebec at La Calouflaire, and we had about 50 dealer, influential dealer of the network, who came and ride the REV for an hour and a half. And I was super happy because at the end of the three days, they were all super excited to go to the club and they became the people talking to others dealers. What was the initial feedback overall from the dealer network? What, what was the initial feedback? Obviously these 50 influencers liked it because they got to get hands on, but most of your dealers wouldn't have gotten hands on. It's difficult to measure what the, the percentage, but you know, Blair Morgan and the, team, the racing team was already winning in the race circuit. We had the the, the 50 dealer who came to Lac Alocla to try it. We had the media who was positive about it. Then when the dealer saw the machine, all this was, uh, was uh, around and, and obviously they were very positive about it. And our volume the first year was twice what we had planned. Wow. Then we knew that it would be successful. And three years later, we had 40% of the industry. 40% market share of the industry and uh, we never look back. Okay, so the REV has been an unbelievably successful vehicle, not just in the snowmobile business, but in the power sports industry. I mean, it stands alone in, in, as something that shifted a paradigm, redefined a, a recreational vehicle, made snowmobiling easier for a, a whole lot of people, made it more fun, all of those things. Did you ever think did you ever think it would go this far 20 years later? We had in mind 50% market share, even in those years. But I never thought 
that after the 50 we would continue to grow. And now we are 55 plus and we're still growing. With all this success and innovation, with you in the driver's seat, you the lieutenant, is there another rev in the future? When we own 55 plus uh, market share, obviously uh, the challenge is to remain and keep going. Obviously, uh, um, we are continuously working on different things, and whether, whether it's engineering, whether it's our advanced design, advanced concept team here at DNI, uh, we're continuously uh, challenging the current uh, status quo. We have the people, we have the tool, and we have the governance to innovate and continue to push uh, in new direction. So somewhere in there, there might be another rev. Somewhere in there. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking time with us and being so transparent and telling us the story of the rev. Personally, and with our team at Snow Tracks and Super Tracks, we think this is a story that must be told and it must remain part of the history of the sport. It's, it's a pivotal moment and you guys were right at the center of it. And yep. so it's a privilege for us to be able to talk with you about that and sense the passion and enthusiasm that you have for what you do. So don't go and retire or something, okay? Because we need guys like you to keep innovating our power sports vehicles, particularly our snowmobiles. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. It was you. a pleasure. Thank you, Mark. Snow Tracks has been sponsored by Arctic Cat Snowmobiles. The regions of Quebec by the sea. Discover our ride ideas. FXR Racing. Maximum versatility for all conditions. And by MBRP Performance Exhaust. Built for the victory lap. On this week's test ride, we're going to closely examine and ring out a very popular model from Yamaha the SR Viper with a 137 inch track. Why is it so popular? Because this is Yamaha's answer to the 120 horsepower, 600 cc, two stroke class. Yamaha's SR Viper LTX GT has been a solid and credible competitor in the 600 two stroke class. The 1049 cc triple cylinder power plant is the hands down nicest running four stroke mill in the entire snowmo biz. The icing on the cake is the boilerplate reliability this engine displays. You're probably wondering why year after year we keep picking this 1049cc Yamaha triple as our favorite four-stroke snowmobile engine. It's all about throttle response, throttle activation, and throttle transitions. It is seamless and smooth like no other four-stroke motor. The 1049 uses three throttle bodies and three injectors to deliver precisely calibrated fuel intake from the engine's EFI system. This is different than the 1049's four-stroke rival, the sophisticated 900 Ace Triple from Ski-Doo. ski uses one throttle body, which is located further back from the cylinder's intake. This means there is still some, albeit reduced in model year 2023, throttle lag from the Rotax Triple. The Viper's short intake runners mean throttle response is right now, with literally no, zero, zip, not a throttle lag. And so, my snow-crazed friends, the Viper accelerates like a really good running 600cc two-stroke sled. There is no disappointment to the way this responds to throttle inputs. Acceleration is exceptional. Clutching on the 2023 Viper is in the hands of a Yamaha-built primary and secondary. This duo has proven effective, sturdy, and kind to drive belts. The Viper's explosive torque-induced acceleration is enhanced in model year 2023 by the sled's now standard 137 by 125 inch camso shredder. Unfortunately, there is no ice ripper option. I digress. The good news is this 137 inch sneaker plays a tangible role in keeping the torque rich 1049 hooked up when plying the throttle in twisty terrain. Suspension is a big deal in this trail biased marketplace that the SR Viper plays to. Good news is this. The SR Viper comes standard with three Fox QS3 compression adjustable shocks. Two up front, one on the rear arm, and the middle shock is an aluminum body coilover IFP design. 
This skid uses Yamaha's proven sliding front arm system to deliver an exceptionally plush ride in jigglers. In essence, the front torque arm decouples itself under certain impacts, letting the rear arm couplers take over the transfer of power to the chassis, while the front arm benefits from operating with reduced spring and shock interaction until the bumps deepen when everything goes back to normal. It's a sophisticated design with roots in snowcross racing. In this segment, Handling is almost as important as suspension. And this is one area where you may have to make some compromises or at least get adjusted to it. The Viper is a four stroke. Four strokes, generally speaking, are heavier than two strokes. And so there may be a learning curve for you adjusting to a little bit heavier ski pressure and heavier handlebar weight. For most people, it happens automatically and everything's cool. Essentially, there is a time of adjustment as you familiarize yourself with both the immediacy of throttle response and the extra weight up front. It is not an insurmountable challenge. It's just different than what two-stroke riders may be used to. What doesn't require any adjustment to appreciate is the SR Viper LTX GT's amenities. There's an attractive and highly functional mid-height windshield, a super comfy heated seat, and a full 20-inch deep rear storage bag that blends into the Viper's tail section and the aforementioned Fox QS3s. A magnetic tether works perfectly, as does a dual-face instrument cluster, which can be toggled to display a plethora of data. There is an ever-increasing and growing number of snowmobilers who are interested in buying a four-stroke snowmobile. If you are amongst this herd of buyers, I would strongly suggest that you find a way to get a ride on an SR Viper 137. You certainly will be impressed, just as we were.